freak. Terrorizes. Wait till they get a load of me. Every punk in this town is scared stiff. Hey, who is this guy? What are they seeing up there? Oh, my God. You wouldn't hit a guy with glasses on, would you? I don't know who you think you are. What are you? I'm Batman. Somebody tell me what kind of a world we live in where a man dressed up as a bat gets all of my press. The making of Batman was a marathon. It was not a sprint. It was a marathon where there were constant speed bumps and at any moment, failure faced you. Whether it was developing the script, whether it was finding the filmmaker, whether it was casting the picture, whether it was the budget of the film, whether it was just the anxiety and fear of this unique project that was dark. It haunted the project from the very beginning. Batman created just a universe that I could really believe in. And I always regretted that as my favorite character in comics, it had not ever quite been portrayed the way I thought that Bob Kane and company really intended it to be. And I really wanted to see that creature of the night emerge and let the world at large see that there is more to Batman than pow, zap, and wham. And for about 20 years, whenever anyone mentioned the word Batman or wrote about it in print, pow, zap, and wham were always attached to the name. I wanted to detach it and get back to the heart of the character. I think that Batman is a seminal movie of the last quarter century because it broke all the rules, it redefined what a um, tentpole movie should be. It dealt with the kind of effects and the kind of artistic choices, casting choices that had not been done before, very gutsy. Tim was on the forefront of a generation of new filmmakers and even the way we marketed the movie. All parts of a whole that, you know, are never easy to come to because when it's uncharted waters, it's lonely out there a little bit. seventies at Indiana, they had an experimental curriculum department at the College of Arts and Sciences. And the deal was this. If you had a course that was non-traditional that you wanted to teach at the university and could then appear before a panel of deans and professors and convince them that your course was worthy of academic credit, you could wind up teaching a very unique course to college students for credit. This to me was a golden opportunity. I decided I was going to teach the world's first college accredited course on comic books. The dean, with his eyeglasses sitting right at the end of his nose, looking down at me over them, said, so you're the fellow who wants to teach a course on funny books at my university? Mr. Uslan, I appreciate what you're trying to do. I used to read comic books all the time. Superman was my favorite when I was a kid. But comic books are cheap entertainment. They're junk. You can't convince me that they're modern day folklore or contemporary mythology. And I looked at him and I said, are you familiar with the story of Moses? He said, yes. I said, could you summarize for me the story of Moses? He then said, all right, um, Hebrew couple um, had a son, firstborn. The firstborn were being killed, so they put their infant son in a little wicker basket and sent him down the River Nile. And he was later discovered by an Egyptian family who raised him as their own. And then he grew up, he became this great hero to his people. I said, that's great. You said you read Superman comics? He said, yeah, I used to read them all the time. I said, do you remember the origin of Superman? He said, sure, planet Krypton was about to explode. And a scientist and his wife take their infant son and put him in a little rocket ship and send him to the planet Earth where he's discovered by the Kents who raise him as their own. And he stopped and he looked at me and he said, your course is accredited. 
Well, my life changed rather quickly because one day, shortly thereafter, I get a call, and it's from Stan Lee. I thought that was so great. At last, somebody was recognizing comics as a valid form of communication and entertainment. There are few colleges now that don't have popular culture courses, and so many of them concentrate a great deal on comic books, movies, television, you know, the usual. But comic books are now lumped in with the others, so I think that's terrific. I got a call from Saul Harrison, who was the vice president of DC Comics in New York, and he said, everywhere we look, we're reading about your comic book course, and this is great thing for the whole industry. We would like you to work with us. We'd like to fly you into New York and talk to you about ways we might be able to work together. And that was the moment I said, my next dream in life, I want to produce a definitive, dark, serious version of Batman as a movie. The way Bob Kane and company really originally intended him back in 1939, as a creature of the night, someone who stalks criminals from the shadows. That's what I wanted to do, and that's what I set my sights on right at that moment. As the fates would have it, I wound up getting a job with United Artists in New York City. It was the only studio based in New York City at the time, and I had the great fortune of meeting Ben Melnicker. My son Charles told me that a young lawyer with whom he was working at United Artists said that he would like to talk to me about Batman. I tried to explain to Ben how I thought Batman could really work as a movie, why it was important to do it dark and seriously, that we could really reinvent the whole genre of what is a comic book movie, what is a comic book superhero. I did uh, tell him that I thought his ideas were absolutely electrifying. And the next step, of course, was to make the deal with DC Comics. We did make the deal to secure an option on the motion picture rights, including animation, but excluding television for Batman and all of the characters in the Batman world. And on October 3rd, 1979, Bat Film Productions, Inc. was formed, the deal was signed, the money was paid, and I thought we were off running to the races. Much to my surprise and chagrin, I was turned down by every single studio in Hollywood. These studio people we approached uh, didn't like the project. And after maybe five or six or so, of rebuffs like that, the thought occurred to me. A person I knew, Peter Guba, and his partner, Neil Bogart, had a company called Casablanca. I put the call in, and I don't think I had more than a two to three minute conversation with Peter when he said, get Michael and come out here right away. I think it was about three days later, we were in Los Angeles, pitched the whole thing in person to Peter, and he said, I get it, serious, dark, this is what we're gonna do. Um, go into our business affairs guy and don't leave here until we have a deal. And about three days later, we had our deal and thus began the what would turn out to be a 10-year odyssey to bring Batman to the silver screen. At that time, we were at, with, associated with Universal. The property itself was a DC comic and DC was part of Warner Brothers at that time. Um, and we looked at the project, presented it to Universal as a project to develop, and they passed on it. At that time, Frank Wells was the top mojo at Warner Brothers. And he was eager to get the property back under their wings because he looked at it as an asset that shouldn't be developed or exploited away from the Warner's family since they owned the legacy of Batman and it was a cornerstone of the DC comic company. And I remember that his eagerness led us to a deal with Warner Brothers. And I think that was really what started the whole process going. When I came to Warner Brothers in 1980 and Bob Daly came um, a few months thereafter, they had, of course, at Warner's made Superman. Batman was the next DC hero who everyone felt this is the way to go. I asked to be um, involved in the development process and the process, you know, became legend. There's making the movie and getting the movie made. They're two different things. It sounds like, how can that possibly be? Well, it is, they're just completely different. And they actually take different skills. 
In getting the movie made, Superman played an enormous role. And Dick Donna did a brilliant job with Superman. And it was an enormous success. It was a different kind of picture. And so it provided the momentum and the celebrity and the attention of Warner Brothers and the recognition that they shouldn't let these assets out of their keep. Superman was a kind of a trailblazing movie in the sense it was the first big budget comic strip that ever made money. Conventional wisdom said that comic strip movies were not going to make money. That first Superman movie was superb. And it brought families in, not just little children. It, it made people realize, hey, these, these are more than just little comic strip characters. These are fascinating characters, and, and they're incredibly imaginative, and they're, they're visually exciting. The biggest obstacle was trying to find a uh, tone and direction, and for us all at the studio to, to agree to agree on that. We went from various extremes. You know, Joe, Joe Dante, who went on to direct many movies, including Gremlins at the studio, and um, Ivan Reitman, who did Ghostbusters. Many, many people wanted to be involved with, with the creation of Batman and writing and directing. They naturally wanted to follow up Superman with Batman, and I was sort of a logical choice. But it pretty quickly became obvious to me that you couldn't write Batman and Superman the same way. They're totally different characters. When I created the Batman in 1939, he was a dark, brooding vigilante. And his general genre changed in the mid-60s with the event of the television show in 1966, where it became campy and comedic. And I, like, I prefer, I've had my druthers, I'd rather have the dark, profound, uh, mysterioso Batman rather than the comedic one. I think Batman had been haunted by uh, the 60s show for, for, for years after that show had ended. And I don't think there was any way to shake that in the public's mind uh, until some of the better known comic book works of the mid to late 80s came out. Around the time that Frank Miller's uh, Dark Knight Returns came out in 86, that really charged up Batman's look and it really redefined the character as a dark, grim and gritty character. Once movie producers saw that, they said, yes, that's the Batman we want to do. We want to return to the very early, stylish, uh, artistic roots of the character. And that's something that the audience hasn't seen. And it looks nothing like the old uh, mid-60s serial. By and large, the translation from the comic book to film or to television has suffered the more it's gone away from its source material. That is, the, the campy old TV show of Batman was essentially mocking the source material, but it was much campier than the comic book had ever been. If you look at the most successful superhero movies of recent years, they've been the ones who are truest to, to, the, to the old comic books. It went through so many iterations of screenplays that at some point, the screenplay and I don't remember whether it was the first year, the third year, it was definitely more like the fifth or sixth year. It was a time where, when, you know, we stopped giving out the comic books and we stopped really, you know, dealing with the toys and all the rhetoric kind of like flattened out and somebody was saying, okay, show me the money, meaning show me the screenplay. I want to see the words on the page. Project had been kicking around for quite a while and had been at Warner Brothers and I think they had, you know, they had uh, done a couple of scripts they had talked about, you know, all kinds of different approaches. They were going to do an Art Deco period Batman. They were going to do a comedy Batman. They were talking at one point, uh, if, if I'm remembering properly, about uh, Bill Murray as Batman and Eddie Murphy as Robin. In The Hollywood Reporter was a story about Batman may not be made because the script was just rejected by the studio. And if they don't come up with a, a better script, then they were going to shelve it. And Bob was devastated by that. He prayed for somebody to come along to, to get Batman back on its feet, and uh, the someone was Tim Burton. Well, I had been working at Disney, did a couple of short films, uh, Vincent and Frank and Weenie, and uh, you know, this is kind of languishing there at Disney with not really much to do, and uh, uh, this person, Bonnie Lee, for, worked at Warner Brothers, saw my short films and was very supportive of me and, and, and actually, you know, kind of helped get me my first movie, which was Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Uh, she showed uh, short films to Paul Rubens and the producers of that, and uh, so it was great. It was, uh, 
actually one of the simplest, easiest jobs. I actually had more trouble getting a job in a restaurant than I did getting a, that job, which was where I was very grateful for because uh, that sort of got me started and uh, started at Warner Brothers. I had wound up having an overall deal, a writing deal, at Warner's, and my mentor there was an executive named Bonnie Lee. And eventually one day, uh, uh, I met Tim in her office, we got along pretty well. And a couple of weeks later, I was talking to Bonnie and she said, you wanna, Tim, Tim asked if you'd come over to his office. And I said, sure, I'd be happy to. So I went over to Tim's office and we sat around and shot, shot the shit for a while. And uh, at the end of the meeting, he says, well, would, would you be interested in taking a look at this Batman thing? And I said, ah, finally, yes. Uh, yes, I would, if, if you insist, Tim, I would be willing to take a look at this, this, this Batman thing just as a personal favor to you. I got to working on the script and got to working on the, it, the thing with Sam uh, before Beetlejuice was released. I mean, because I actually, you know, didn't quite get the green light until Beetlejuice was released. I think they were sort of waiting to see. I mean, they, they, they believed in me, but I think there was that final piece of the puzzle, like, well, did his last movie make, is it going to make some money, you know? And so once, the, you know, once the first weekend, once Beetlejuice opened, it looked like it was going to be a relatively, you know, you know, be okay. Uh, that's when we got the green light to do Batman. I mean, I'd been working on it, though, up until that point. Here came along a fellow uh, in Tim Burton who liked the original material and liked the comic material and had a sensibility because he was a graphic artist. He came out of that that milieu. So he had a sensibility about the material and yet he had already made films and quirky, unique films. There was a danger in that because it didn't look like what everyone thought it was. But the value of that was it, the imagination and the intuition took everybody to another place. And what he baked into the process was the most important element in a film. He built risk into it. He said, I'm gonna take this to another place where there is not a lot of certainty. I'm gonna give you variety. And that scares people, it scares studios, financiers, and it did all the way up the food chain till the very end. But that was the component that helped, that very risk component helped get it made and helped make it what it is. Though we were made for each other. Beauty and the beast. Of course, if anyone else calls you beast, I'll rip their lungs out. People think you're as dangerous as the Joker. <laughs> He's psychotic. Some people say the same thing about you. What people? I liked the Batman character because I could relate to him. I, I related to the duality, the kind of hidden side of a person, the two sides, light, dark side, the kind of internal side, you know, not speaking much, lonely. That's something that just I could feel and, you know, it's always nice to feel the thing that you're working on and so you can bring something to it or, or at least emotionally relate to it. So it's, 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 it's those elements that did it for me. 
Tim has a, an incredible visual imagination and a wonderfully dark, twisted sensibility. So I think that his own sensibility was very, very much in line with Batman as we at DC Comics saw him. And after many failed scripts and, and many attempts somehow to realize Batman with different directors as well, Tim was the right director and Sam Hamm was the right writer to write the first draft of what eventually became the first Batman movie. The idea that interested us most was to go back to the original Bob Kane notion. And we thought that that was the version that would give us sort of the most entree into the story that we wanted to tell. To go kind of dark and mysterioso meant that we could also say we're going back to the roots of the character. You know, we're, we're kind of paring away all the detours that the character has taken over the years and trying to, you know, zero in on, on what this original concept was and what made it stick around for 50 years. Sam's approach, you, you know, was, uh, I thought, really the right right, right thing, you know, just it's in the same vein as those other comics, just taking it a bit more seriously, exploring the psychology of it. I mean, it was, it felt like kind of new territory for that kind of movie at the time. Most of the first two acts are Sam Hamm, and then Warren came in, you know, uh, may he rest in peace, and, uh, and he did a good job. Sam's script was a lot like the movie. That, that turned out, and Sam did a great job, and it, his whole sensibility was in there and fun and everything. But I think what Warren Scarron did was sort of lay it out in a psychological way. And he was so succinct in his psychology and, and you know, emotionality of the characters and the story and everything. We'd ask him any question about any character in the script, and he had an answer, and, you know, what felt like the right answer for motivation and things like that. So it was really refreshing. We had some huge structural challenges that we had to work out. Uh, we were orig Originally, Robin was supposed to be in the movie, and the structure that we had worked out for the story really did not admit Robin very easily. I think almost everybody across the board just was happy not, you know, no Robin. I think, uh, I can't recall one person that was going, we gotta have Robin in this. There's also a historic reason why Robin shouldn't even be in the first picture, and that's because the first year the Batman was created in the comics, he worked solo. He was created in May 1939's Detective Number 27, and Robin didn't appear until Detective Number 38, so he did operate for just over a year on his own, and by the movie reflecting that, all it really does is correctly capture the mythology of the characters. I think the process was a normal one, but somewhere along the line we just realized it had to be authentic. That's the word. We wanted it to be darker. Bob Kane got in the process. You know, we did a lot of homework with Jeanette Kahn, who was running DC in those days. We all encouraged each other to stick to what the real Batman was. And of course Tim was the key to that. If Britain had fallen out of the project, the project would have collapsed. When you add a component in that's so vital to it, and it gets going, and that person were to move away from the project or leave it or abandon it, it's very hard to get another vision keeper. It's very difficult, not impossible, but at that stage with that kind of quirky project, with something that was becoming so much of his vision that it was difficult. Now we had a balancing act. We had to keep him in and keep him very aggressive and active on the project, and yet we didn't want to let the project run away with itself. So we're balancing a lot of forces in getting this film made. 67, take one. Action. Excuse me. <laughs> Could you tell me which of these guys is Bruce Wayne? Well, I'm not sure. Thanks, anyway. You have to recognize that you're, when you're making a movie, that you're in the selling business from the minute the movie gestates, from the minute the movie is announced, from the minute the first comments reach the press, there's an impression about the movie. And when you have a property that's a lightning rod, like Batman, when you begin to cast the picture, everybody has an opinion, because they know what that character meant to them in their youth, or has they read the comic, or when they saw the television show, and they even question whether they should make it. Well, Michael Keaton was a was a firestorm of activity when he was cast. Well, Keaton was controversial at the time because everybody thought, Michael Keaton, that means the picture is becoming a comedy. Of course, Tim had just done uh, Beetlejuice, 
with Michael Keaton, in which he was spectacular, but it's not the sort of thing that you would necessarily look at and say, oh, look, here's this guy, you know, is an incredible physical comedian. It's not you instantly think Batman. At first I thought it was a joke, and I laughed and said, yeah, Mr. Mom is Batman, that's very funny. When they explained that everybody was serious about this, I, my instantaneous response was like every fanboy. I was shocked. I said, oh my God, this can't become a campy Batman again. I remember that this was so newsworthy that the front page of the Wall Street Journal, of all places, had an article about what was wrong with us for choosing Michael Keaton to be Batman. You can't buy that kind of publicity. On the front page and the left column, show you the level of celebrity it reached, said, what a ridiculous choice. This is the silliest choice. This is ridiculous. That's not where the character lies. Now, this is a, this is a major financial paper, an institution, talking about a creative enterprise. So the good news is they're talking about the creative enterprise. The bad news is they're creating questions in the part of the management. Oh my God, what are these folks doing who are managing our asset and our money? Us. So you always have that yin and the yang. You know, you get the noise, but you also get the light. It was kind of a shock to, to, to uh, some people when we cast Michael Keaton. And I, I did hear filtering back from America that, oh my God, you know, this is going to be a disaster. It's going to be like the TV show and blah, 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 blah. And they're just going to camp it up and do that. But, you know, we, we knew that that wasn't the case. You know, I thought he was absolutely right for it. Tim saw something in Michael's eyes. Uh, they were very alive and interesting. And a lot of the time he was wearing a mask or a cowl and he needed what, what came from his eyes. I had cast Michael before that in a picture called Clean and Sober, and I knew he was a fine actor, but the eyes got him the job. It's like with Michael, you look at, you look at him and he's just got those eyes and he looks crazy and he looks just like, but he also doesn't look like a superhero. It's like, he looks like a guy who would need to dress up like a bat for effect. The comfort zone was, uh, was Tim Burton. I knew I at least, you know, could put my my, my trust in someone, uh, at least to some degree, you know, even though it was a huge challenge to him and a, and a risk to him too. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like that probably, but it, it was just a difficult movie to do and a big thing to pull off. When he called me and said, I'm, I'm doing Batman, I'd like to do it. Had it not been him, I, I wouldn't have even read the thing. But I figured if it's coming from him, this is worth reading. And then I knew immediately who this guy was. I just knew what, the plan, what I would have done. The risk came in because of the, I think, the scale of this thing. But if this character doesn't work, this movie doesn't work. Now, I kind of knew that, but I didn't want to think about that, or I was a dead man. What Michael Keaton captured was the traumatized Bruce Wayne, the neurotic Bruce Wayne, the Bruce Wayne who you could believe could at night put on a suit and go out and fight crime. Tim indicated, I, I don't exactly know how to put a serious actor into a Batman costume without getting inadvertent laughs from the audience. He said, but he did know that with Michael Keaton, they could create a portrayal of this driven and consumed Bruce Wayne, and audiences would go, yeah, yeah, he could do this, he would do that, and thus the suspension of disbelief. Michael Keaton has a quality, uh, when I watch him, when I watch him as a, as a performer or as a personality, and even working with him while I was watching him, he has three qualities. He has a, there's a comic quality, there's a uh, vulnerability, but there's also something underneath. You feel that there's something underneath going on. There's a mystery there. Michael was phenomenal. I. I adored him as Batman, and I know there had been some controversy, and you know some people had they were very reserved about that that choice at first. And I thought I got it immediately. And there was something about Michael that I could just see as an, as an orphaned child. I bought it. I bought it from day one. Being a big fan of irony, um, I just think it's great. From you know seeing seeing back looking at it all, I, I just think this is great fun. But no real vindication, I mean, it wasn't all that severe, just people saying, I don't, I mean, except for the hundreds of thousands of people who were protesting in the streets, I guess, you know. And when, when they hung me in effigy, that was a little, for me, harsh. Hello, Vinny. It's your Uncle Bingo. Time to pay the check. 
there was a conversation about who should play the Joker. And there were ads with Batman. There were nut names, you know, Robin Williams, other every, so many actors wanted to be the Joker that everyone had to be dealt with appropriately. Jack Nicholson as the Joker, I mean, it's like you don't even have to be a casting director. Right? Nobody even have to say anything. I mean, that was just everybody's first choice because he is the Joker. I mean, there's just no question about it. The fear is almost more like um, he's almost too perfect, but I mean, he's so great that he even transcends that. You know, he even goes beyond your expectations just because he's so good. We had known Jack Nicholson for a while and the idea was, would Jack play a role like that? This is not the kind of film Jack Nicholson played in. You know, this is the guy from The Last Detail and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. We're talking about a force of nature, an acting force of nature. Jack was never one to just work with a director. There was no one, no actor alive who respects a filmmaker more once he decides to do it. But he has to decide to do it. So Tim had to convince Jack that he was right. And I remember we went up to Aspen and Jack says, let's go riding. He's gonna, he's gonna meet Tim Burton. And Tim says, I don't ride. And I said to him, you do today, you know? And there's a picture of him on the horse with, with, <laughs> with Jack. And Jack's a good rider, a really good rider. And, and Tim Burton looks like he discovered God on that horse. I, I, I was t terrified and it's like, there's, I'm out with Peter Goober and, and Jack Nicholson on horseback, you know, up in, in Aspen, I'm going, I didn't realize this was, you know, horseback riding was part of my job description, but uh, it was, uh, sur you know, it was a surreal moment. He was not a happy camper, but he did it, and Jack committed to the project. I don't know because of the horse riding, but but I think that uh, they, they had a good bonding there, and that moved the project yet further ahead. Once, you know, so somebody like him gets involved, it just raises the bar of everything else, uh, uh, and... Uh, just creates a buzz about it and an excitement that, that just permeates everything, really. I was afraid because of my feel of the television series and the way movies tend to be done and talked about, I didn't want this to go through the normal, let's brighten it up for the kids, you know what I mean? I thought this was a, a very strong, in every way, transitional movie about the genre and really why they wanted me in there. You know, in other words, on a superficial level at that moment, it gave it, oh, this is not just another cartoon movie. It changed the nature of the comic framework into a film, from a movie into a film with the inclusion of Jack Nicholson. There was something to be discovered there by the critics and by the media, because they would find it intriguing that Jack wanted to do that. Part of the thinking in getting Nicholson was really similar going back to the Marlon Brando concept in the first Superman picture. You get such a great deal of respectability for the picture, for what you're trying to do, that not only does that help bring audiences in from young to old, but it also makes it very attractive to other major stars to want to become the next Batman villain, to follow in the footsteps of Jack Nicholson. When Jack entered the movie, the balance of the movie started to shift a little bit. So you wanted to, you know, play to your strengths. You know, the Joker became a little bit more than he actually was in the earlier drafts, which is only smart. You know, you make the you make the changes. It's no different than a sports team making the adjustments at halftime or something like that. To this day, I always took this performance more seriously than probably anybody in the world because I looked at it that way. My early experience told me from working for an audience full of children, the more you scare them, the more they like it. The worse you are, the better. Because that was my response to the Joker. I mean, after all, this is a hateful occurrence, this man. And if you looked at it literally, every kid loves this guy, I believe. And I particularly love just the name, Joker. It's fantastic. The studio felt the marquee of, of Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson changed the nature of the film. And he recognized that. And they negotiated a very strong deal, especially in the back end, because it was a short schedule. It turned out not to be a short schedule, though. And because of his presence, and because of his performance, and because of the weight of his, of his existence, really, he made an incredible, indelible imprint on that genre and on that film, and made a lot, I mean, a lot of money, and deservedly so. Hi, I'm Vicki Vale. Vicky Vale, yeah, yeah, photographer, Vogue, Cosmo, yeah, yeah, listen, listen, if you want me to pose nude, you're gonna need a long lens. 
Vicki Vale was originally Sean Young. Uh, it wasn't Kim Basinger. Kim had to come flying at the last second. Sean Young was there. She was there for four or five weeks of pre-production, and Sean wanted to go and practice her horse riding, but she fell off, and uh, we were about a week away from shooting. Falling off that horse was something that just kind of, I couldn't hang on. You know, I just couldn't hang on, and there's kind of a poetic symbolism about that. You know, it's like, in, in a way, I look back at that particular time in my life, and I go, wow, I wish I'd been able to hang on to that horse. You know, I wish I'd been able to do that, because then the, 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 the turning point in my particular career, I would have been able to stay on the film. I would have been in a big box office hit. I would have been able to go on to other big box office hits. I would have, you know, and then that kind of domino effect would have, would have uh, occurred in my career. So it, that was the turning point in my career where it, that didn't happen. Unfortunately, Sean Young had to be replaced. And, you know, at the time it was quite a panic, if you like, to recast her. John Peters and myself, Tim Burton, huddled on the phone with Terry Semmel at the studio, talked, talked about several actresses. Kim was right at the top of the list. Everyone got excited about Kim Bassinger, and I think I had to be the one with, these, with Barbara Kalish um, faxing the script to uh, Los Angeles all night, every page. This was in the 80s, so the fax thing was different. I think it was much more a case of who is available tomorrow? Who can fly to London tomorrow night? Who is capable of doing this part? You know, there was a lot of who, who, who's available, who's, a, you know. And, and it, it very quickly, you know, there was only, you only got, you know, three or four people that could actually catch a plane in two days' time and come to England for, you know, three or four months, five months to uh, make a movie and be somebody who they could put up on a marquee and say, you know, this is Vicki Vale. And that's how Kim got it. They called me and I found myself on a plane over to London. That's actually how quick it happened. I had no time to think. I just found myself walking onto a set. And I remember the first day I walked on the set, I said, this is not a movie. This is an experience. This is a phenomenon. This is, this is just, I just knew in my heart this was going to be far more than just your average movie. Kim luckily came in last minute, you know, and, you know, it was kind of, uh, I think, probably a strange uh, circumstance for her because she's kind of, like, last minute throws it thrown into this sort of boys club, you know, <laughs> with all these guys, you know, where's the girl, you know, and, and uh, but she, she was great. I, I think she gave a really solid, I mean, she, you know, with this kind of material, somebody like that, uh, her, her and Michael and the other actors that give it a grounding, you know, you're taking this sort of fantastic material, but trying to find a reality in it. And she was always trying to, you know, just find that real strong, simple reality. And, and I think it, it, it helps this kind of a film quite a lot. It was like Alice in Wonderland. I mean, it really was. I, you know, I didn't know what to think of it. I really didn't know at first. And I was submerged in just a, a small fraction of it with the car and, um, of course, Michael and his outfit. It was just wow. It really was wow. And what number are we starting with? Is it going to be one week, two weeks, a year, six months? We're going to do it in five days. Any officer in this city that is proved to have done anything wrong is going to be out so fast he will not know what hit him. The things that keep you going in a shoot are the actors and the crew and what you're seeing, you know, and 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 therefore that that's that's really it. And I remember Pat Hingle, Billy D. Williams, uh, Michael Goff. I, I mean everybody that we got in there are real, you know, great actors and, and just up the level of what the project was. I like working with him because he leaves it, he, he gives you the problem, he explains how it works and says, now play with it. He does leave a lot to you, and that's exciting, and encourages you to, to go in that direction, you know? Tim doesn't live here on the ground with the rest of us. He lives up there somewhere in a, on a cloud 
somewhere. I mean, he his whole thinking, you know, he's brilliant, brilliant, but he's just not one of us Earth people. He was so tuned in on the take, you know, on, on the whole thing, Tim. I mean, this is Tim's creation. Um, I mean, John Peters, you got to give him credit with Peter and John for putting it together and staying with it for a long period of time because they went through a lot of drafts. But, you know, it's Tim. I mean, I have to say Tim. So those are the forces that were at work. Each one helped the other. And that was what you wanted to try to have happen. And I think the chemistry that Tim and the studio and ourselves brought to it was as much by the movie God as it was by our own divining and skill powers. I mean, the movie God plays a role in it. It's like you just, you have to work real hard, get the right thing and get a little lucky. Okay, let's go right away. It's, it's, an, it's, it's what you're suggesting is an interesting thing because you don't want it to look like too. You want it to look like you're wounded, but you're, you're still going for it. Do you know what I mean? At, at the time, people get tend to forget Batman was the biggest movie of all time, most expensive movie, and there was a lot of people's careers riding on this thing, um, especially at, at the Warner Brothers end. A lot of money involved in this thing. The set at Pinewood Studios was spectacular. There was nothing like Gotham City. I can't quite explain why movies like this are difficult to keep track of, except to say they are enormous. And I'm amazed at Tim and, and everyone else who worked on it. I mean, everyone else who worked on it, because everyone has to kind of keep up with it. One of the things I think I had about this movie is I knew how big it was going to be. You know, I knew this. For instance, they had a good feeling about it, but in the area which I'm involved in it, well, I don't care, but I mean, it also caused me some dough. They were totally unprepared for the level of the success of the movie. It was Tim's vision, it was his eye. You know, once you bought that, you bought that eye. The question was, how much does it cost and where can you make it less expensive? Not cheap, less expensive, or as inexpensively or as controlled as possible. And that brought us to, the, to, to, to England to do that. It was a big movie and there wasn't really the space uh, in at, at Warner's to do it, so there wasn't a lot going on in England. So uh, Pinewood Studios seemed like a really prime candidate because it had the space and it had a backlot area where you could build out on, which was nice. And it you know had the artists and you know talented people to make a project like that go. And for me, it's a way of sort of being away from all of the business side of it, trying to focus on the movie, which was important and good, and you know, kind of away from all of the hype that was back in, in, in America about it. Because, you know, when you're making a movie, you don't like getting caught up in all that because you, you have to make it. So I think it turned out the right place to do it. I think a lot of it, I'm sure, was Anton first, who is an incredible, dark, interesting character. If you looked at Anton, you know, you eager to played a part in Batman very easily, well, that's good, Tim Burton. So you had these two guys, and you had Roger Pratt, who's a wonderful photographer, I guess really kind of balancing the two out a little bit, you know, because Anton would go off and craze ideas that sometimes weren't possible. His team would bring him back a bit. Tim had really wonderful ideas. He knew exactly the look he wanted. It was a tough shoot during the winter of 88, you know, December, long night. So we used to be filming up on the Gotham streets and, you know, you'd start at four o'clock in the afternoon. It was already dark in England and you'd film right through till 
you know, five or six in the morning. It was still dark. You never saw daylight, and it went on for weeks on end. It was a difficult shoot because it was, for the entire shoot, it was a six-day shoot. But I don't think I'd ever do it again because I, I found it quite counterproductive. I mean, you're, you're, if you're shooting a movie, you're basically working every day anyway. So if you're shooting six days, though, you don't have really any time to prepare for the next week. So I kind of felt like a, a fighter in the middle of a fight who didn't have time to take a break and just take a step back. So it was a difficult shoot uh, that way. And it was, uh, you know, in the winter at night. So like for three months, I didn't think I saw daylight at all. Once we got in production, the astounding thing to me about Tim was and is the unshakable central self-confidence and lack of fear that he has. When I watched him, this was part of the scuttlebutt, his Batman was the biggest production in history in England in terms of production costs and so forth and so forth. And watching him, and you see this, you, I'm pretty low key, you can see it on me, you don't see pressure on this kid. I'm thinking, geez, this guy's in his early 20s. He's got the biggest budget in history. It's not even a factor. You know, he just goes about his business and does it. Being relatively new to, you know, the first big movie, uh, I, I was very grateful for Jack's support because, you know, he, he told me, you know, he just said, don't let them, you just get what you need, you know, and don't let them get to you and that kind of thing. Just was really cool that way and helping me get through the process. Tim was under a lot of pressure. He hadn't had that big blockbuster yet, so it wasn't like, you know, whatever you want, Mr. Burton. So um, there was definitely pressure. I mean, there was pressure between him and, and John Peters at times, and I think John you know, made some good contributions, uh, the, the, some of the fight scenes he really insisted upon. But, uh, you know, there was definitely pressure between the studio and the producers and Tim just to sort of, you know, get it all done and get it all good. It was such a great challenge to me that I had all my work cut out staying alive. There was a whole old school of, uh, of production that in a way probably thought better people could do it than me, certainly. Not that it was um, blatant, but I think there was that feeling. So I was struggling to do what Tim wanted. I also think that in a certain sense he was considered to be very young to be doing that sort of thing and doing things which no one else had done. Batman, the first Batman, was made the old-fashioned way, you know, with model shots and that type of thing. But most things we did in Batman were done for, for real, you know, whereas nowadays you, you, you have the luxury of um, doing a quarter of it and someone on a clever computer does the other three quarters. But I think that's why the first Batman has such honesty about it. Is it Halloween? Part of what went very right on this picture collaborative ideas on a real level about the material itself. Halfway through shooting, um, Jack and John Peters go to see the Phantom of the Opera. And at the end of Phantom of the Opera, there's a scene where she goes up to the tower. And the Phantom and the big conflict at the end, the big climax, take, takes place at the tower. I don't know how the story went if John turned to Jack, Jack turned to John, but said, you know, this is what we need. And the next day, they started writing that scene, the whole ending of the tower. A script is a blueprint. It isn't the Bible. It's a blueprint for a movie. It's a navigational stake for all the components that make a movie. It, it is capable of being changed. It is changed. Lines happen, things happen, and you see the evolution of the material. You saw the scenes that were shot before, and you realize all of a sudden, I already have that value. This scene now has to get a different value. You know, in a project this big sometime, I've come to know you can't say, hey, we'll wing it to everything. You have to be well prepared. But having said that, because of the original freedom and, and, and gradual trust with the whole group of people making the movie, a lot of this movie comes from just moments of improvisational inspiration right there, some before, so or o overnight or as you went, some actually while you're doing it.
I plead innocent. Didn't do it. Didn't do it. I did not have the Joker being uh, the murderer of Batman's parents. That was something that, that Tim had wanted, you know, from early on, and I had a bunch of arguments with him and wound up, you know, talking him out of it for as long as I was on the script. But once the script went into production, there was a writer's strike underway. And so I wasn't able to be with the production as it was shooting over in uh, uh, over in London, and they brought in, you know, uh, other people. You know, there's certain little punch-up things you want to do, uh, dialogue here, this, you know, a little bit more Joker this, uh, Batman that, you know, little things. But those little things end up sort of turning into big things, you know, and it also has to do with budget and things and what can we do, what can we not do. By suggesting a few little changes sometimes, it just it sometimes has a tendency to kind of just... In, in fact, some people complain that, you know, by letting Vicky Vale into the Batcave, that uh, that was too much. So, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult crowd to please. <laughs> I, and I didn't write that one either. I mean, I I, I, I want I, I've been asked about it so many times. That's that's the one that they asked me about. I said, How could you have Alfred just let Vicky into the Batcave? And I have to say, you know, I I agree with you. That is that is Alfred's last day of employment at Wayne Manor. The shooting schedule had gotten to the point where things had to be kind of wrapped up quickly there, and that's how that came about. The idea that the script changes, of course it changes. It's just the blueprint, and of course actors ad lib, and of course the lighting changes, and of course opportunities arise. That's why it's called filmmaking. You know what I mean? You're making something. You know, it, 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 it's the process that makes the magic. We work give and take together. A lot of the spirit of what we all wound up going for in the script, in refining and in the shooting of the picture comes from that kind of thinking, you know, fun kind of collaboration. I was working up these ideas and uh, there was a lot of skepticism about whether I was the right guy for the film, which I understood because I'd never done a big film, I'd never done a big budget film, I'd never done an action film. So I really had to prove myself, and I'll, I'll never forget, there's a presentation I had to make. John Peters was there, who I, I think was very skeptical. At first. I know he was skeptical. And Tim was there, and I was playing this idea and that idea. It was a little bit scattered because that's the way my brain works. And John, didn't understand this process, and I could see his face was like, I could already see it, like the bubble over his head. I wonder if this composer is available or that composer. And um, then Tim said, play the march, play the march, play the march. And I put on this Batman march, and John jumped out of his chair, really just almost started dancing around the room. It just definitely was not an easy, relaxed project, but I've learned since then that none of these you know, kind of shows like that ever are. Yeah, and, and even even if you're at the end of it too, if you, because I don't know, she's moving her head up. Yeah, she's she? moving her head up. So. Once you set the date for a film, you say, we're going out and you declare that date to the marketplace on June 19th, a set of forces are in action. You set that whole motion in action. The exhibitors, the distributors, the media, all the people, and everybody builds towards that date. It's very perilous to change it, very perilous. I don't mean to change it a day or two, but you start changing it a week or a month, three things happen. One, they think the film's no good. Two, it costs an enormous amount of more money. And three, you get out of sync with all the forces that you've used to market the film, to bring it to that moment where the expectation of the audience is realized by the movie. So what you really want to look at is, once a studio picks a date, it creates a lot of force for you, but it creates a lot of drama around you. It's hard now to explain just how unique the anticipation was for Batman and the explosive nature of the fans and the movie-going audience as it was gearing up and getting closer and closer to its release date. At the time when we made the movie, there was no real talk of uh, the word franchise or you no know, real market, you know, not a lot of merchandise. It was sort of pre all of that kind of stuff that now is... Just commonplace, really. The first Batman movie, in my estimation, was the best marketed movie in the history of film. It was incredible. You couldn't walk 10 feet without seeing someone in a Batman t-shirt or a Batman baseball cap. People were buying the Batman ties, the t-shirts, the hats, the cufflinks, the underwear, everything. It was like pajamas. That Halloween, the next Halloween, everyone wanted to be Batman. I think when I saw the Batman cereal, that's when it hit me. You know, whoa.
Every bit of joke or byproduct and paraphernalia sold before the movie was released. They were out. They could have sold billions and billions more of these things, but you know, you make these situations, you gotta make the deals, gotta be manufactured, shipped, all this. You can't just say, give me 2,000 more Joker, you know what I mean? So, in a way that's uncommon, you know, apropos of hype or this or that, they, they had more customers than they had product for this particular movie. I remember one day somebody brought in a logo and we all looked at it and said, what is that? It looks like somebody inside of somebody's throat. It was the logo for, for Batman. What made it unique is you didn't know exactly what it was for the first second. And then, like so many visual images, it emerged exactly what it was, so it required something to happen in your brain. And that risk of that, of that logo embodied the aesthetic cinematic equivalent of the risk of the film. This is beautiful. You know what I mean? This is a great piece of graphic art. And you know, that goes all the way back to Bob Kane. That emblem, and the Batman emblem, that's what really sold everything, that emblem. You didn't have to say more. You didn't have to do anything but show that, that, those bat wings. Then Mark Canton and Peters wanted the Prince music. You know, he kept saying, we're gonna have Prince do songs because Mark Canton's big hit, up to this point, had been Purple Rain. And where, and where, the Batman. Prince was also a Warner Brothers artist, so I think we had talked about several different artists and coming up with something, and uh, he came up with some crazy song, and it became, that was a huge hit. And I think that, that hit before the movie, so that was a great sort of juggernaut with it. I do remember meeting him for the first time in the Batcave, you know, he kind of actually fit, you know, when he, when he walked in, it was kind of funny. You know, we, we used three fourths of his songs in the movie, and then, you know, he had written so many songs that they sort of released a companion conceptual album that he had, had done. So I guess it was the first time that I'd ever gotten an idea of like studio conceptualizing about things. Keep busting. Vicki Vale. Hi. Bruce Wayne. And what do you do for a living? We cut this 30 second trailer. We took it to Westwood and we decided to test it by just sticking in front of an audience. And we did and we got a standing ovation for this trailer. It was such an incredible demand to see that trailer that movie theaters were being contacted to find out what time the trailers were showing and people were paying to see movies they didn't care about just to watch the Batman trailer. And then they got up and they left the theater. I'll never forget that trailer. Such an amazing trailer they put out. The first trailer for the movie, which some people call a teaser. I flat out call it a trailer because it showed a lot of footage and kind of give you a hint of the plot. You know, they really literally could have had somebody come out with a chalkboard and just wrote, Batman. That could have been the whole trailer and all of us would have been like, ah! I remember sitting there watching what must have been like maybe 90 seconds of, of the trailer on TV and going like, wow, that looks great. Nicholson looks phenomenal and scary and the suit looks good and the darkness and the world, I was thinking like, oh, this, this rocks. This is gonna be really, really good. It was meant to kind of stop the negative rumor mill, I think. It was a way to kind of stop the campy camp talk. It, of course, unfortunately also became the hot item at uh, comic book and science fiction conventions as people started paying up to $25 just to get a copy of the trailer. Bus stations where the posters were were being broken into and people were taking the posters out. There was a dearth of posters all around that had to continually be replaced. Something very different, something very big was brewing. And again, it comes back to this masterful marketing strategy that the studio had put together. I can remember the single piece of hype that I did, though. So now the year it's coming, this is the way I felt about this movie. The year it's coming out, I'm down to the Oscars, where all of show business is there and so forth. And uh, I run a Jack Valenti friend of mine comes up to me, I'm in the toilet catching a break downstairs, and Jack comes up and says, well, you know, he's very enthusiastic, man, I'm the Batman, and into my head flew this. I looked him in the eye and said, Jack, let me tell you something serious. There isn't a single person in the movie industry qualified to estimate the top 
on Batman. He said, what? You guy, what? You know, the movie's not out yet, but this is my idea of street publicity. You know, I got Jack Valenti, I know. And sure enough, that show was not over before the story was starting to come back to me from the people who were at the Oscars this year. So I knew I'd done a real good job of guerrilla promotion with that one. Once the ball gets rolling and people can perceive it's going to be successful, everybody climbs on the train. Everybody wants a piece of the action. And in this case, the distribution group saw that they could make a lot of money because they had a lot of what we call pent up desire about the film. Not just curiosity, desire. Not just interest, but definite interest. Number one interest, seeing it first and across a broad core. A very wide age audience was looking at it. And it was both male and female. So the idea was to get it as wide as possible, as broad as possible, as fast as possible. And this was one of the first films, if not the first film, that set the stage for one of these mega releases. You know, a large number of screens, a very concentrated media push in that pre-week, week area, in order to grab all the money in and create a firestorm, create something that would feed on itself.